All right, let's try this again. Let's see if you guys can hear me. If anyone's out there, let me know you're listening. And um, I want to test out this this microphone before I get started. So if you are listening and you can hear me, please let me know how the sound quality is, and then I'll plug in the microphone. So I'm going to get started talking about what it is we're doing today. And um, yeah, if somebody jumps on, just let me know how the sound is. Once you are on, then we'll get going with that. So I still haven't got my new try. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Linda. Okay, Linda, stand by for one second. I'm going to plug in my microphone. So microphone is plugged in. Let me know if you can still hear me. And if you can, and if the sound is better and that sort of thing. So this is a heck of a way to start um, testing a new microphone. But I don't see any response yet. So if anybody... Still sounds great. Okay, perfect. In that case, let's get started. So uh, most of you watch this in the replay anyway um, from the sounds of the comments. But hi, Linda. Nice to see you here. Um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to show you how I work in in like a small series so that I can accomplish a lot of work in one uh, short amount of time. If you do shows and things like that, it's your little ones that tend to be your bread and butter. So I'm going to show you how to um, get the, the base, the background of these all started at the same time. And because you're working in the same colors and the same papers, the... Um, the uh, you know the consistency is there so you can always change your images and things like that but that's how I'm gonna work so I'm going to show you um, I don't have a actual kit here but um, at the store we sell the regular cradle panels in sets of six and hi Denise nice to see you um, <clears throat> so we sell sets of six I'm sure you can find sets of six anywhere but uh, when we ordered our panels I made sure that I bought common sizes in groups so that you would get better uh, value from that so at a curated nest uh, .com, you'll find our panels but then you'll also find the panels in series so it's a it's a more affordable way for you to buy your panels and that's what I'm working with today is a series of or a set of six four by fours so in order to show you how to do that first I'm just going to lay these out these are not my empty panels but these are just a different panel so let's just pretend these are the same ones that I'm working with and we're going to put them together like this oh there's a message on the back trust your purpose there you go so these are ones that I had been working on before all right, so now we're going to lay them face down like that, and then you're going to use your masking tape or your painter's tape, and you're just going to basically tape them nice and tightly together. Um, now, the tape that I'm working with today, not going to lie, it is really annoying because it keeps ripping. So I may not show you the entire process of taping things together because this could make what is normally an under one hour video into something painfully long. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to tape the insides together first with a little piece just to line them up and make my life a little easier so they don't move. And then, okay, so let's pretend we tape all around. Then what we're going to do is we're going to go all around the outside and tape them together as though they our one big panel. So once you do that, I'm going to go all the way around. Pinching that together. You want them to be, I mean, fairly tight. We're going to separate them later. So just making sure at this point that they're all nice and tight and that they're sort of lined up. It'll just make your, your life a little easier later. And I'll turn that. More tape. So 
of course now this tape is making a liar out of me because it's actually working just fine so hello Anne Marie we have a um a friend non-artist friend um watching today so thank you nice of you nice to see you here in the live so today i'm making series based small art and there it's just one approach to making um lots of little paintings um that have a common theme hi debbie common theme and common um elements in one fell swoop so we'll be finishing them individually but we'll be starting them together so now you can see i've, I've taped my panels together so that is going to be our surface that we are going to work on i'm going to put this aside now because you can see how we're working on that one piece and now that's just going to be in my way so for ease of operation let's pretend because i need a big surface to work on let's pretend that this is uh, nine little panels that i've i've taped together so what i did was i went ahead and i drew the grid to show you because that's basically what this is except this is six this is nine so because i want to show you how i treat these glued pieces or taped pieces together as one uh, background so because i'm going to be finishing these in encaustic i need to make sure that everything i'm using is um, going to be um, friendly towards the encaustic medium so we can't have really any acrylic or any shiny base materials in here and so for that reason, I am going to be adhering all my papers and stuff with wallpaper paste. So let me grab a brush for that wallpaper paste. Of course, that's the one thing. I normally keep a brush inside my wallpaper paste. And today I didn't do that. So talk amongst yourselves. Give me one second. I'm going to grab a brush. Okay, isn't it always the way you don't have what you need when you're doing a live? So, um, essentially when I start with um, collage, I always do a glue to glue method. So that prevents air bubbles and really helps me treat um, the board as, as a sealed unit because the wood panels are not sealed at all. They are very porous, very thirsty as I always say. So if you put the glue on just on the board and put the paper down chances are it will have absorbed the um, the moisture from the glue before the paper even gets to it or vice versa if you put the glue just on the paper then you're going to end up with the same thing the paper is also very dry very thirsty and very absorbent so it will also just sink or soak up all of your uh, the moisture from the, the glue so in this case i am using one of our ephemera packs from the store. So these, um, Pam and I personally make these in the store. So these are ephemera packs for those of you who don't have packages of, yes, it is wallpaper paste. Yep. So um, anyway, I'm using an ephemera pack from the store. And of course these are full of old vintage papers and acquired goodies that we put in here just to make your mixed media projects er, um, easy for you. And they're all color coordinated so if you tend to be a person who doesn't have a lot of paper a lot of um, uh, papers for your mixed media then this is a good place to start if you are collecting mixed media papers it can absolutely be a rabbit hole like one of those alice in wonderland ideas where we end up collecting papers and papers and papers and you don't know where to stop and when to stop collecting papers. So I put glue on the back of the paper and glue on the surface of the board. So now I have what I call a glue to glue situation. And once you put your glue to glue, then you're going to need um, a little squeegee, a little applicator tool or credit card or something like that that doesn't have a lot of flexibility to it because you actually need to start from the center and push the glue out. We need to take this excess wallpaper paste out or we are going to end up in a situation where it's um, never gonna dry on you. So I'm gonna take the excess out. Now my wallpaper paste is 
quite gray because I used an all pencil to make my lines, which is a water soluble pencil. So I'm not going to throw it back in the um, in the in my uh, bin of wallpaper paste. Rather, I'm just going to wipe it off. Normally, I do just add it back, and then we're going to continue to collage this. So. On this side, now that it's a short piece, right, I'm actually missing some, but on my nine panel, or sorry, on my six panel, that piece of paper would have covered the whole thing. So for now, I'm just gonna go ahead and add a little bit more so that you can see how I'm not cheating. Now I treat the whole thing as one, one piece of paper, meaning that, or one panel. So I'm not going to, um, start designing and and figuring out what's going to go where in the end and all that this is very intuitive very free but i do have a few rules of thumb that i will share so right now i'm just going to cover everything with a bit of paper there we go and i always grab a color coordinated pack of paper first if you take things that are too random it's a lot of work for you later to try to separate things and and make them um, you know homogenous at the end I'm just gonna put a little bit of glue there and of course I'm not worrying about it hanging over the edge I'm just making sure that they touch the edges because what's worse than things hanging over the edge are things that that don't actually touch the edge now you might be wondering why I'm not doing glue to glue in this case um, I'm not doing glue to glue because this is tissue paper. So the only exception to the rule um, about glue to glue is with tissue papers and napkins and rice paper. So anything that's so delicate that if I were to flip it over and add glue to it, like I'll do right now, especially napkins are the worst, but it makes it really difficult to move because this becomes so fragile and wet. So tissue paper is is um, sort of the, the smallest offender in that capacity. But it, the napkins and the rice paper are near impossible. So, um, so you see now that I've kind of lost sense of direction of where my six, or in this case, my nine panels are, right? So I'm not worrying about that anymore. Instead, I'm just applying tissue paper and layers. So I can go on and layer this thing up with as much um, or as little paper as I want. But the idea is to have a good amount so that later on when we separate them, we actually have something to respond to. Now pay attention to that word because that is my favorite word in art making. Um, it allows you to be really spontaneous and in your work, allows you to take out any stress that may be associated with making art. After all, none of us joined the realm of the art makers to be stressed, right? Well, that is kind of the opposite of what we've done. So I want you to eliminate any stress you may have in making art by just being very random, but I try to make sure that all of my sections have something. So I know down here, for instance, is um, going to be a square, right? So you can see that. So obviously it is missing because missing elements because right now we've got stuff going on in all of them, but in this one we've got nothing going on. So I am going to um, add some more paper down here. Pattern papers are great for this because they collage in so beautifully and they add line and they add dimension. I don't have any lines on this one. This is just like the plain one. But if you had um, some paper that had the sewing lines on it, those are really great because when you divide it all up, then you have some navigation, some direction. And so let's add, now we've got the same tones going on. Maybe I'll add a little more of that up here. And then also I have none there, two more areas of some random brown color. There we go. Okay, so now let's add a few more elements. So you can see I've got, with this tissue paper, I have a natural pattern to it. It just happens to be like little scratch marks, which I love. Um, so now I've got some, I've got some text. 
I've got some little stars, I've got some random scratches which look like mark making, and I've got some solid areas. So what I'm going to do is always look for something different and not always the same shape. So what we tend to do in our art is we tend to always repeat the same thing. So we're like, okay, I'm gonna tear, 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 right? And we tend to tear the same shapes, tear the same size, tear the same everything, and then nothing ever ends up random. So in order to be really random with this, I'm going to um, ask of you to just lose the rigidity that you might have with the planning. So um, some other p patterns that you might want to put in. Okay, so let's say you have scrapbook paper. So scrapbook paper is lovely because it comes in lots of random colors and patterns and this is just a torn little piece. Um, and I'll add this just so that I can show you how it works. The best thing you can do with something like this is actually pre-wet it. So uh, I do have water here actually. So I'm gonna bring over my little water dish if you have a spray bottle handy, just spray it and then let it sit aside for a few minutes just to absorb that water. And the reason we're going to do that is because scrapbook papers, as lovely as they are, they are double sided. So it's actually two pieces of printed paper that they've sandwiched together in most cases. And that's why we have two lovely patterns, right? One on each side. And although they are both lovely, they do compete with one another and um, so we have to decide. If you're really, really patient, you could actually let this soak in water and you can separate them. So I have, when I've loved both sides equally, I have spent the time to separate these, but today we don't have the time or the patience, so let's not do that for today. But what I am gonna do is, because I've got sort of five sort of circles here, I'm going to cut them and collage them in. Now, you know I have nine panels in this one and I only have four and a half or a quarter circles. So this is actually really good because now I can show you how we are, I just told you before to make sure every square has something, but if you knew exactly where you were going to be putting these, so I'm doing glue to glue again, by the way, just you could, if you knew where the lines were, you could actually put them halfway through the line. I could put them over here. Now you'll notice I haven't added a lot of color before now. So I tend to leave the color for later, only because if I add the color too early, unless I know like everything's gonna be very yellow tone at the end or very, you know, red tone or something, then I can work in those colors, but I tend not to add too many colors early on. Oh, I said I had five, here's the other one. And I'm just gonna put it randomly here. There we go. Okay, and then I have to push out any excess glue. All right. Now, if you had, um, if you had more collage to do, go ahead and do it at this point. What I'm gonna do though, is I'm gonna start showing you how to incorporate the paint. So at this point, I'm going to use um, probably my little applicator tool and a brush. And because I want this to be encaustic um, compatible, I'm using my chalk paints. So at a curated nest, we sell both the um, Colorantic, which many of you are familiar with, but we also have a new line now called Dixie Bell. And the wonderful thing about both of them, I've tested obviously both companies to be compatible with wax, um, but what I really like about the Dixie Bell is their variety of colors. So they just have a really broad range of colors. Whereas with the Colorantic, they have beautiful colors, but we are limited in size, or sorry, in, in color choice. Um, the advantage to the Colorantic is that they do have the sample size. So we do sell the, the sample kits of the little ones, which are two ounces. But generally, the and then the next biggest size in Colorantic would be this size, the eight ounce, which happens to be the smallest size in the Dixie Belt. So as confusing as that is, um, great colors, large quantities, large quantities for what we do. And, um, but Colorantic also has, as you can see, they have like huge containers, right? So I use a lot of white, I use a lot of the vintage cream. So I have these big containers for those two colors. 
and then I tend to go into the smaller um, with my colorantic for the more specific colors. Okay, so now I'm going to add some color to this and I'm going to grab my brushes and I'm going to start maybe with the cream and I'm just going to start applying it like super randomly. I don't want to cover up everything. I want to put sort of globs and any pattern that you have in there and texture, we don't want to cover it all up, but it is necessary to edit. Meaning that if you've planned your collage so specifically to the point where now there's no room for editing, for applying things, then just take note your collage is a bit too tight. It's a bit too finished right from the beginning. This is something that I always encounter with students when they make their collages. I try to time them and speed them up and tell them, you know, be as fast as you can. And then I don't know how they end up doing it, but they end up creating something that they're afraid to touch later with some paint. So I'm going to encourage you to not put anything too precious on the bottom, especially images. Okay, so you'll notice I haven't put any images into this because images and text really restrict you. So if you put like, let's say your favorite word is behold and you put behold in there, then you're always going to be painting around behold. We're never going to be free to not bury that word. So any images, any text, leave it for later. And has a curated nest moved? Yes, we have moved. Hi, Janice. Um, we have moved. So we are in the studio now. So we have moved and we are completely changed. We are an art supply store now and selling um, art and art, I, I won't say general art supplies because we are actually selling uh, mixed media supplies and it's mostly curated by me. So it's all things that are compatible with both encaustic and mixed media and uh, we are less, yeah, the pandemic sort of threw things up in the air for us and I thought, you know what's never ceased to change for me is the fact that I will never stop painting, pandemic or not. So, um, yeah, so that is why you find me here today. Hi, Leslie. So that is why you find me here today um, with a store that has, has moved, but also really changed focus and direction. So yes, thank you for asking. And you have been to the studio. We have moved into um, the main space in the studio. So I am now going back with my little squeegee. So you saw I applied those little dots, right? So I have a couple ways I can move paint around. I can move it around with my brayer or I can move it around with a little applicator. And I'm gonna do it with the applicator only because I'm a bit more specific with that. If I use the brayer, cause I put my paint on kind of heavy, I will end up being, um, it'll cover most of the board. And I don't want that. I still want little bits and pieces to show through because that was the whole point in doing collage on the underside in the first place. So that, all right. That's all I'm gonna do for paint on this one. And then I'm just gonna use my baby wipe and clear off my little tool. All right, so the next thing that, so this is wet and this is gonna to have to dry, right? There's no two ways about that. So before you do anything more to these, um, before you, sorry, before you let them dry, you are going to have to do anything more that is going to take time to cure. So in my piece, which I'll show you in a few moments, um, I have actually added a river of little glass beads or little micro pearls. And, um, oh, they're all like statically charged. It's kind of fun. Anyway, so what I did was I just took my Mod Podge and I created like a little river of Mod Podge right through my painting. And I created two to make sure that it was going to touch at some point all six of my tiles. So you can kind of see that, right? You can see my paint's all wet. Anyway, so I'm gonna have to lay this flat. I won't be able to hold it up in a moment. So I wanted to show you I've created that. And then I have my little vial here of um, beads and those of you doing encaustic are probably wondering if I'll be able to add encaustic to this little river and the answer is no because the glue is actually just pure acrylic um, but I don't want to I just wanted to add another dimension and something a little more interesting in there 
So I'm going to take these little beads and using just fully putting them into this painting. There we go. In a nice river of beads. Um, and we sell these so inexpensively at the store, these little vials of things. I think it comes in like three or four different colors and textures. And this is like $3.99 or something. So great value, but this is the kind of product that I'm trying to bring into the store to show people different ways of using things. So, um, so you can see, I'll try and bring it over there, but maybe you can see that little river. I don't want to turn it just yet because it's very wet. But you can see I've got that little um, river of beads. Okay, I'm going to put this aside, and then for the magic of television, you'll see that I prepared one of these ahead of time so that I would have something dry and ready to show you the next step. So this is the one that I made previously. So I ran um, some stencils over it, and I did a bit more finishing, if you will, to this one, just by adding more textures. But essentially, it's the same process you just watched. So the first thing we're going to do is take the tape off. So sometimes this is a little easier said than done, depending on the type of tape you've used. But we're going to take all of our masking tape off. And your pieces are going to stay together, except for these ones because I've already pre-cut these, but ignore that. So they're all going to stay together. And um, this is what we are going to work on separating now. So. I'll tell you why I separated those in just one second. Let me grab something that's a little cleaner, here we go, than my table, because I have to put this face down. So the first thing I'm going to do is put it face down, and I'm going to sort of bend it. And what that bending is going to do is it's going to show me on this side sort of where my seams are, but then I'm using my exacto knife i think i have a better exacto knife than that i do that one's a little rusty i am going to cut through and start separating my tiles so if you're not able to cut all the way through it's because you've made yourself really relatively thick and that's okay just flip it over and cut through this side and you're going to be left with all these individual pieces there we go now bits and pieces might come off if you haven't glued them well or something like that hi Leslie nice of you to join us let me know if you have any questions um, so then I'm going to flip them over individually and on a cutting surface so meaning on another panel or on a cutting board even if you have a cutting board in your studio I'm going to trim off the excess paper okay so that's why I was telling you at the beginning don't worry if you have um, like the areas that hang over whoops I've got a bit of tape left there don't worry if you have um, areas that hang over you're going to go back and you're going to trim all this off once it's completely dry. Now you won't be able to do that obviously when it's wet, um, but you're going to go around and you're going to do these to all of your paintings. So up until now, I have to tell you this to me was like the boring part. Now we're going to get to the exciting part. So when I told you that this class would be intuitive and really free and that sort of thing, when you separate your pieces, you have these individual little paper or tiles of uh, panels of art that are ready for, and here's my word, ready for you to respond. So each tile is going to be different, right? It's going to have different um, elements to it. It's going to have different sections. We didn't plan any of this, and then we get to see how we want to respond to these little areas so you can turn them you can flip them you can do whatever you want but the next thing we are going to do when we are planning like you can see with this like darker spot you may want that to be on your um, on the bottom as your horizon you may wish to have it on top and then balance it out with something dark down here you may like it on the side it's up to you and that is the part where like I said you get to respond 
to the and I won't call it a happy accident because it wasn't really an accident that you were making six tiles in the first place um, and I've asked you to be deliberate in your randomness so that you don't end up with planned tiles right because when I have might as well finish these ones now so when I have six little paintings now to respond to this is where the fun and the creativity really comes in because these things can be prepared ahead of time. You can do up so many of these, right, in small groups. And then when it's time to finish that series or time to finish your paintings, you have so many that have already been started. So this to me is one of the most exciting things about working in this capacity is that they still are all individual paintings and they still are all original but the the impatient work of waiting things dry and doing all that stuff can happen relatively quickly if you if you work on a number of them at a time and often when I'm traveling and things like that um, even if I go camping and I need to take things with me I haven't got time or the space to bring all my papers and all my things so leaving with things already prepared meaning these already done like this now I only have to bring a few things and I can respond very easily to this so now that um, okay last one and the reason I'm cutting this one is because this one is a special one that's already dry and so that's why I separated them initially because I don't want you to have to wait with me while paint dries. But now is when we get to respond and finish these paintings. So I'm gonna put that one aside for now and let's just grab one randomly and I'll show you what I mean by respond. So when I'm looking at this panel, um, I can see I've got a great little series of dots up here and then there's rivers down here. There's a little star. There's a few other little things. So I'm going to just take out my chalk paints and finish these up meaning I'm going to set the stage for my imagery so I am always one to have my imagery at this point sort of selected and so what I did was on rice paper I printed a whole bunch of different birds okay so I've got some swallows and I've got some crows and I've got all kinds of birds so this is what I've selected for today um, I often have fish, I often have you know crowns, whatever, but I select that at that time. And the reason I've selected that is because of the size of them and because the rice paper, they're gonna fit so nicely into my encaustic. So I haven't selected which one. I should tell you before you do this, you can also sand the edges. So if you sand the edges using a sanding block or an electric sander, You'll see if any edges have lifted up or anything, you put a little glue back under them, tack it down. Mine are all pretty solid because I made sure I glued to glue and did really well and let it dry. So they're all pretty solid, but you could go ahead and sand those edges as well. Also, if you are um, a taper, which I'm mentioning this because I know Denise is watching. Um, if you like to tape your edges before finishing them, go ahead and do that now too. And then you can start working. So I am now going to respond, if I will, using my chalk paints so i'm just i'm not going to show you the whole way that i respond because that could be slightly boring but i'm just going to start editing so what editing means is i'm just going to start not removing the parts that aren't important but i am going to start um adding some paint and you know maybe your pieces are perfect and you don't have to add any paint but i want to add paint so that i can sort of set the stage for my there we go I'm gonna set the stage for my um, images so I'm going to use my all pencil so those of you familiar with all pencil they work on they write on all surfaces so all these materials will be in our glossary afterwards so I'll talk about that but they are available on a curatednest.com and everything we've used today and they are um, they will be listed in the glossary with links to them so that you can easily find them and the video replay will also be there so don't worry if you're not able to catch this whole thing 
you certainly can tune in later. Okay, so there's a bit of that paint. Now I'm going to move into the cream. Now the reason I'm moving into the cream is because I started with that paper in the first place, the text. And the text has like a creamy base to it because it's a vintage paper. And so I would like to play that up a little bit. go so edit 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 respond 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 so those of you who've taken classes with me know that this is I sound like a broken record when I tell you glue to glue and I tell you to respond but that is truly the way I paint and so I look and I just put a little more paint down I go yep that's good nope that needs more that is really a liberating mantra when you are painting. Respond to what's happening. So you can see I'm starting to pull it together. It's getting a little bit of direction, a little bit of collage at this, or uh, collage, a little bit of direction, a little bit of, um, you know, stage setting. If I want to add more texture, if you find your pieces are relatively flat, which mine aren't because I tend to work pretty heavy handed, but I'm going to make a few suggestions so that they are encaustic compatible. So one is paper texture paste. So you can go back and you can add paper texture paste um, and really build that up. It's gonna to have to dry, of course, before you move into encaustic. And also the chalk paste. So the chalk paste and the paper stencil paste or texture paste work extremely well under encaustic because they are, um, they're really absorbent and they're fibrous and they are uh, even though they have some acrylic in them as a binder the overall uh, uh, bulk of the product is an absorbent product so it works really well under the encaustic so what you can do is you can go ahead and you can apply it through a stencil so this is just a homemade stencil that i made i just cut it out of a piece of acetate and so i could apply that if I want any kind of a stencil or you can use a manufactured stencil and you can rub your texture paste through or you can just freehand and let those dry okay so now that I've shown you this and I'm going to show you how to finish them so it in encaustic so if you are just skipping the encaustic part and you're going to go to faux encaustic or you just like the texture of that or whatever it is you're going to do um, any of your varnishes and stuff like that then you would go ahead and add your imagery at this point. So I am, if you are an image person, if you just like this little um, randomness and beautiful texture and little abstract piece, then go ahead and just seal them and finish them as you do. I'm not saying they need images. I'm just saying if you do, that is a good point to put them on. Um, and so I'm gonna pull all these aside now. So you can see how responding to each one individually becomes a very therapeutic, very um, personal experience, okay? Um, oh, I forgot to mention one more thing. So if you decide you wanna add more collage at this point, you would just use your wallpaper paste and add it with a small brush to the back and to the surface. Or you can use a glue stick if it's extremely small. So if I'm just putting in a little tiny bit, then sometimes, whoops, I just dropped my glue stick. Sometimes I will just add it directly to the, um, with a bit of glue stick underneath. But in this case, these pieces are large enough that I'm going to have to get out my, my wallpaper paste. So I'll put a little bit behind. Not much because I don't want it to squish out too much. And then where I want to have it. Okay, right there. So I'm actually going to put it right over my little river of, of beads. So I'm going to put enough glue there that I can press this in and make it conform to that shape. There we go. I'll push it in and then with my brush I'll really push it down and then to get off any excess I'm just going to use um, my baby wipe and just really push it in now you're going to require that that dries okay like that really is not going to be um, 
able to go into encaustics just yet. And then if you want to add your pop of color at this point as well, it's a good time. So I went ahead and I made these little, I took a little star stamp and I just stamped some of my leftover paper. And so I might collage that in just so that you get the idea of adding some color. So let me go ahead. There we go. And I am going to put my glue on the back. Put my glue where I want it. And where do I want that? I want that right down here. Okay, so again, just responding, no planning. And then push it out with my baby wipe because it's a nice small piece. You can see I've just added a little pop of color down there, another little bit of texture, and a little bit of um, you know something different, another element. Okay, so the next thing is the encaustic. So this is where the fun comes in. So I have one pre that I prepared earlier that I responded to and it is fully dry. So it has everything in there. It's got paint, it's got texture, it's got um, the, the chalky paste, it's got these little random marks are my all pencil, um, lots of different things. But a lot of the colors that were underneath really guided my hand with this. Um, and it was probably the least exciting square out of all of them. You'll find that some are easier to respond to than others because they have some element to them that makes them already fun and less uh, work to respond to. This one didn't have a lot in it. So that would be my caution to you about not putting enough um, in that one area. So I'm going to bring over my wax and I'm just going to bring over my clear medium to start. Now, those of you familiar with wax know that you have to keep it molten, you have to keep it heated in order to paint with it. So I'm avoiding that little river and I'm going on either side of it, but I'm not covering the whole thing. I'm not one of those people who likes the entire painting covered in wax, only because to me, it just, it adds another layer of interest to have different dimensions in the encaustic. So I'm kind of building it up thicker in some spots so that I have a nice foggy area and then leading up to that river. There we go. I have a nice little um, base for that. So I'm going to fuse it. So that is the white encaustic medium, the bleached. And now not every painting is best fused with a torch. So in this case, I'm just going to use my, um, the, what is this called? An embossing tool. So the embossing tool or heat tool is great because it doesn't deliver a lot of heat. And on these small ones, it's actually good because it's just going to be enough that I'm not going to, um, uh, burn the, the papers that haven't been, been covered in wax. So if I use my torch, I risk that anything that hasn't been covered in wax is going to catch on fire. So I'm just going to use this. Like to do what I call a full fuse initially. So a full fuse is when you take that textured wax the first time and you melt it into a complete puddle and then let it cool. So as it cools it's going to be foggy and it's going to um, um, start to solidify obviously. 
but what that is going to do for us is it's going to ensure that it has good adhesion to the mixed media layer. So if you just lightly fuse it, then it's never really bonded because encaustic actually means to fuse in or to bond in. So I need it to bind with that layer underneath. So a full fuse really is necessary the first time around. So now you can see I've got different textures in there and I've got this lovely area of warm wax in here. And I'm gonna add a little bit of white wax, uh, even though it's behind a white background. No, I'm not actually, I'm just gonna collage in my image. So <laughs> last minute decision on that. So I've already cut out a swallow for this one because I thought it would be interesting. And I'm going to position that where I want it. Now remember this is in rice paper. So in the warm wax, I'm able to just slightly push it down. I'm going to use a little bit of the glue underneath where it's going to touch the tail, or sorry, where the tail is going to touch <laughs> the beads because I'm not putting wax there, so just a little bit. All right, and I meant little, little, little bit. And now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna add a little more of the clear medium. So I'm gonna bring over the brush rather than bringing over. The whole pan. Just so I can show you. So I'm just going to add the medium right over the bird area. And remember this is rice paper, okay? This has been printed on rice paper, so it's very, very delicate. And then by fusing it in, it should lay completely flat. especially because it's a small surface area. And for those of you in the Ottawa area, I'm actually teaching the rice paper transfers as a workshop um, in May, the end of May, I believe. And it's a fun little workshop um, because we will be printing all of our own pictures on different rice papers, different Tibetan papers, different things like that, so that you can see how easily you can incorporate them into your work. Anyway, and then I'm just using a little tool because it might be end up being a little foggy right over the image. So I'm very lightly removing some of that wax. Now remember, as it cools, it will clarify, so I don't need to remove all of the wax. But I am just ensuring that it's going to dry a little clearer, especially over the image. Now at this point I can treat this like any encaustic painting and I could go ahead and I can do any of the other things that I'm used to doing with encaustic. Um, but I think maybe on the river I have an idea to add a little bit of um, on the river. No, I like the river as is. So I think I'm going to add a little bit of gold leaf, just a little speck. So um, I have gold foil, which comes in sheets, and I also have the gold leaf. And so I'm going to use my gold leaf because I want this to be fairly random. And you can see this container has a lot of randomness going on in it. I'll close that up. I am running my fan in here to keep these um, the uh, ventilation on while we're working. And so ventilation and foils are a funny combination. So I'm just going to add some of this, like I said, very randomly. And I'll be happy with that. But if I do need to direct it a little bit, there we go, then and you just burnish it in with your finger. If you did need something more specific, then of course you would just use your um, the sheets and cut out the shape you need. And then you can always go back in with a tool and scratch into it.
go. And there you have it. So that one is finished and can you imagine that in a very short time I will have six original paintings all completed at the same time and or relatively the same time but by working in a series like this and by buying your panels in six packs um, or in multi packs you'll save but you'll also give yourself guidance and direction for the next time. So thank you for watching I am going to repost this tutorial um, on our website so on www.curatednest.com and I'll add that to this video as well. Um, it will be saved in Facebook but for reference to it all the time it's at a curatednest.com and if you go to our learning center you will see it under the um, uh, I'm not sure what to title it yet but it'll probably be mini art series or something like that and it'll be a list of all the supplies that we used as well as um, and links directly to them um, as well as a replay of the entire video so i thank you again for watching the video will be up within the next few days um, for replay and otherwise the uh, material list and everything will be up later on today or by tomorrow so thank you sophie thank you denise thank you everybody for watching thank you everybody for tuning in and we shall see you on tuesday next week bye bye now